Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, praise the Lord. We do thank you for joining us for another Central Jersey Bible Amen uh, Institute uh, discussion. And uh, we do thank you for joining us for the encouragement series. Um, uh, truly, it's the blessing of the Lord to be able to have the opportunity to uh, come together as an assembly to break the bread of life. Uh, truly, uh, we do need to thank God for such a thing, uh, to be fed by the Lord, uh, to have an opportunity to reason with the with each other uh, on the scriptures and the uh, hopes of coming into a better knowledge of the truth, to uh, sit in an atmosphere that, Lord willing, is conducive for his spirit to move around in is, uh, is such a blessing. How is it not possible that the good of God will uh, flow uh, amongst all of us if we are in such a place as that. And so I do thank the Lord uh, for what he has done and what he is doing um, and uh, providing us this, this forum this evening. Amen. Before we uh, get into the uh, lesson for the night, um, let us go before the Lord and uh, petition that he will bless us with his presence uh, in Jesus' name. Let every heart pray. Uh, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we love and thank you. We ask, Lord God, that you would have mercy upon us all. We ask, Lord, that you would look upon us with great favor. And we do thank you for giving us an opportunity to come before you, to sit at your table. We thank you for the delicacies which you have offered unto us. We pray, Lord, that you will look upon us and see us as a people, Lord, who are here for no other reason but to worship you, to revere you, and to sincerely, Lord God, desire of all the good that you have to bestow upon us. We truly do want to be with you. Uh, we truly do want to be acknowledged as your friends. And Lord God, we pray, Lord, that you see that uh, in us, not just in lip service, but truly from the heart. We ask, Lord, that you rebuke the enemy from us, that we may be able to learn of you without distraction, and that we, Lord God, may uh, walk from here feeling so much more fuller in the spirit than we are even right now. So we thank you. Lord, we ask that you would bless us uh, with all of your wisdom and your ways. Uh, keep us rapture ready. Bless every household represented here, those that are on their way, those that couldn't make it, bless as well. Bless the church. In your wonderful name, we do pray. Honor the prayer requests. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen and amen, everybody. Uh, praise the Lord again unto you all. Uh, we again thank you for joining us for another Central Jersey Bible Institute Encouragement Series session. Uh, truly, again, God is uh, a wonderful God to uh, give us a forum as he has uh, and I'm praying and I'm looking forward to uh, the good that can come from this assembly this evening. And uh, so giving honor unto the Lord who is the head of my life. Uh, praise the Lord unto the pastor of the house, as well as the president of the Central Jersey Bible Institute and the person of uh, Elder John Betts and to his wife, First Lady Loria Betts, uh, to the mother of the house, Mother Ida Harrell, uh, to my wife, uh, Sister Chantal Bonnet, and uh, on behalf of the board, of the Central Jersey Bible Institute, we say praise the Lord unto you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, praise the Lord. This uh, particular lesson um, is actually a two-parter, and um, uh, the title is uh, The Increase of Love and the Mortification of Sin. And uh, the one companion verse that I did want to read, uh, uh, you know, with this uh, scripture in mind, or rather with this topic in mind, uh, is coming from uh, the book of Romans, uh, chapter eight, and I'll read. I'll read the. Uh, I'll read the uh, the verse just before it, uh, but it says here in verse twelve of Romans eight. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, uh, ye shall live. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word, that he may sanctify deep within our hearts, that God truly make it the glory that by in Jesus' name. Amen. And um, uh, just looking at that, uh, that one verse, that last verse, uh, where it speaks about, um, um, it's, it's giving us uh, the comparison that if we live after the flesh, um, it's telling us what the end result will be. Uh, but then it says, if we live after the spirit, um, while mortifying the deeds of the body, uh, we shall live. And that's what I want to, uh, where I want us to hang our hats on for this discussion, um, the importance of mortifying the deeds of the body. And uh, when you read, uh, praise the Lord, uh, in the Bible, uh, the Bible speaks about uh, these particular uh, deeds of the body. 
Uh, when you go into Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 19 to 21, it reads, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulent, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things uh, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So these are the works of the flesh, which also can be translated as being uh, the works of the body. So with that being uh, in mind, if we go back again to Romans uh, 8, 13. It says that if we live after the flesh, or we live after the deeds of the flesh, uh, or the, rather the deeds of the body, we shall die. Notice also too in that particular verse that Paul uses flesh and body interchangeably to say the same thing. But if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we, through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, so it's in conjunction with the flesh that he had just spoken about, uh, but if we mortify the flesh, if we mortify the deeds of the body, the works of the body, um, uh, we shall live. So the objective for everybody, everyone, and I'm not just speaking to the saints, but I'm speaking to everyone because the Bible says that God doesn't, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance and be saved. The objective is to mortify the deeds of the body. And as we had already listed what those deeds are, uh, it's a litany of, 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 of evil. Um, these are the works of the body. Uh, if you were to go and to visit the body's office, uh, you will walk through the, the doors and you would see that they are busy. Uh, the, uh, the workers inside are busy within the body trying to see that all of these things come to pass. Um, it wants to be an unbridled uh, wild beast so it can do these things. Just think about the mindset of the body, if the body, if the deeds, if the body wants to have these things happen, uh, you mean to tell me that the body wants to have adultery happen, fornication happen, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, wrath, heresies, envies, drunkenness, revelings? It wants all of these things to happen. Yes, it does. Uh, the Bible says that this is within everybody, because all man has sinned and come short of the glory of God, everybody. And then once we stepped into that, um, that domain of, of sin, um, now the deeds of the body become these in this list. It is impossible when you think about it for anybody uh, to believe that they can overcome these things uh, just because they willed it. Uh, this is what's programmed in the body. The body is programmed to do these things. Uh, there's nothing that you can do on your own accord to sever that. This is the way we are wired. And, you know, uh, there are those folks out there in the secular society who believe that, look, if you do a few nice things, you know, if you show, uh, uh, you know, that you care for somebody, if you show that you love somebody, if you all of these, that they believe that those few nice things are enough to convince God that our bodies don't behave like this, that list. But the Bible says that when it pertains to uh, the clean animals uh, that you find in the Old Testament, the clean animals were clean because they did two distinct things. And he was very specific about making sure that the Israelites understood uh, his people rather understood what these clean things, what designated them as clean, um, uh, the things that designated them to be clean, which is they had split hooves, these animals, and they chewed the cud. And he, the Lord made sure to say, look, you know, if they do one, but not the other, they're not clean. You got to do both. And so the split hooves represents a separation from the world. The chewing the cud, which was the regurgitating of the food, eating it all over again and going through the cycle all over again, uh, is a representation of meditating on the word of God over and over and over again, keeping your mind stayed on him, praying without ceasing. That's what that represents. And so a person, if they are going to be clean, 
and 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 right uh, in the sight of the Lord. They have to be separate from the world, and they have to meditate on the things of God daily. You have to retain that that knowledge of God on a daily basis, because when we go back to uh, Romans eight, it says, "But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live." It was so important for Jesus to come down here to do what he did. As a matter of fact, he even said it himself. He said, look, it's important that I go unto the Father, because if I don't go unto the Father, I won't be able to send the Holy Ghost down unto you. You need me to send the Holy Ghost down unto you. Lord, why? Why, why is that so important? Because if I don't send the Holy Ghost down to be within you, for lo, me and my father will come and make our abode in you, and you shall have the comforter, that which you are already familiar with, with me, you're going to recognize when the spirit comes, it's going to feel like I'm right there because I am right there. And so it's important that I send this Holy Ghost down to you. Why? Because now once the Holy Ghost comes, you will have the capacity to mortify the deeds of the body. If the Holy Ghost don't come, the deeds of the body will continue on manufacturing everything it possibly can to get you to do what's in that list there, in that wretched list, the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, all of these things, wrath, envy, strife. That's what the body is doing on a day. It's like a factory trying to make sure that all of these things come to pass within your person. You can't escape that. You can try not to do these things, but you're still going to do these things that fall under the umbrella of what the deeds of the body is programmed to do. And all of this is because of sin. Sin is... It's not something that can just sit in somebody's back pocket and you expect it to be sit there. Sin uh, is a rebellious, like a rebellious child. Sin is like a loose cannonball. You can't expect it just to sit and bounce in one area. No, it's going to bounce wherever it decides to bounce. You have those in the secular society who support the LGBT PT plus community. And they have gone on record to say, look, whatever I do in my home, that's my business. Yes, that's your business. But you are not going to convince me that your business is going to stay in your home. Uh, and we have already seen that. I can turn on the television and see their business on the television. I can go down the street and hear and see their business in the public. They are now going into schools to promote their business. As a matter of fact, this month is dedicated to their business, and they have parades about this, uh, walking in front of people's occupations, their jobs, and all of this. Uh, so their business is not staying in their home, uh, but rather it is going outwardly, just like sin does. Sin just doesn't sit in one little place by itself. It just doesn't. It's, it's like a ravenous wolf who will want and take more and more. It has an sen insatiable uh, appetite about itself that it just seems as if it cannot be satisfied. That's what sin does. And the mind of sin is to make sure that it produces everything that we spoke about in that list of Galatians chapter five as it pertains to the works of the flesh. He wants to see the works of the flesh take up the entire person of your being. Now, this is a slap in the face to God because God hath made man after his image and after his likeness. And here you have this alien that has come on board and is trying to uh, reprogram the the image and the likeness that God has made for man. That is a lie. That is a blatant lie. It's an embarrassment. And we do know that this does offend God. Why? Because when you look at examples such as when Israel 
uh, had uh, blackened their 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 eye, so to speak, by becoming uh, so wicked that they were likened unto being worse than the Sodomites. When the Lord said in Isaiah chapter one, I should destroy you like Sodom and Gomorrah. Like I destroyed them. You're just as wicked, if not even more. But for my name's sake, because you have gone out uh, after I have, have, have allowed the Assyrians to take the Northern tribe. And then after I have allowed the Babylonians to take the Assyrians and assimilate the captive Israelites of the Northern tribe. Now they have gone and, and, and taken Judah. And now I have brought all the tribes back together as one, but yet you are an embarrassment even still in that situation because they're looking at you as a proverb and they're, they're speaking negative against me because they know that I'm your God. I'm not going to deliver you for you. I'm going to deliver you for my namesake. And so here, sin is doing the exact same thing. It's mocking the image and the likeness that God has, has made of man. Mocking us is what he is doing. And I know based off of the precedents where we see the Lord feeling offended because Israel is not being the light of the world, but now it's become a proverb that if you follow God, this is your outcome, where man will have the uh, be able to usurp themselves over the people of God. That's an embarrassment. Because the Lord has already said, I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no other. And here you have these prideful folks, such as like a Nebuchadnezzar, who believes that he has gotten all of these things from the power of his hands. And like the Assyrians before him, who believed that the reason why they had the upper hand over the northern tribes of Israel was because of their superiority. And in both situations, the Lord has humbled all of those prideful minded people. You see, you don't think just because you got the upper hand, it may seem like you have the upper hand over my people that I am not God. That's not how it works up in here. Because the, the truth of the matter is this, I have made man upright, but they're the ones that have sought out many inventions. And now they're going out there and trying to make me look bad and that's not going to happen. So the Lord will course correct all of this. We've seen it in, in times past. This is the way things work. He will course correct this entire thing, this mess that man has created and has now uh, you know, put a, a bad taste about the Lord in some people's minds. Why? Because of the mannerisms of those who did not stay in their rightful place uh, by the Lord's side. And by leaving to go out there uh, to run amok, uh, to allow the factory of the uh, body of sin uh, to uh, go on and be productive, to produce these horrific things that is object that is that that is their objective to do uncleanness lasciviousness fornications adultery it wants to do all of these things you cannot trust yourself you cannot and you do not have the power to resist these things because it is a part of your person these things it is in the it is ingrained within the walls of your entire being it's in your DNA. This is something you're going to do. When I want to do well, I find that I did not do well, what Paul said. I want to do right, but every time I try to do right, I keep doing wrong. I keep stepping into it. I feel something warring against the law of my mind, trying to bring me in subjection unto itself. You see, Paul was, was getting deep about the body of sin. That even though I'm saved, he's still here. And the tendencies of, I can hear, I can hear him down the hall, still trying to manufacture everything that's listed in Galatians chapter five, as it pertains to the fruits, uh, the works of the flesh. I hear him. 
I can hear them laughing. I can smell the, 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 the stench of their work. The fruits, the rotten fruits they're trying to produce. But this thing is in, in me. Now, if I didn't have the Holy Ghost, then I will be, as I was born in sin, I will be shaped into iniquity. That's what the Bible says. You will be shaped into it. You'll be shaped into wickedness. He's not just going to just stay as a leave you as a sinner. He wants to get you to a point where you are a wicked person. He wants to get you to a point when when God sees you, He sees nothing redeemable about you. Just like He said and spoke about those during Noah's Noah's time, the men of the world who died in the flood. And he got to a point where he said, it repenteth that I made man. It repenteth me that I made man. There is nothing redeemable about them. They had to die. These men allowed that factory to produce all of these evils, that, that, that stench and the smoke from the factory. Because when you look at uh, the industrial zones of your, of your, of your own city, you see how they all gather together and they produce all this pollution and smoke and all of that? Well, that's how it is spiritually when the body of death is producing these iniquitous things. And the stench of that smoke rises up to the nostrils of our Lord to where he has to come down and say, I got to do something about this. Because if I leave them to run amok, I know the nature of sin. He's going to go around and corrupt everybody. That's what he's all about. He's, a, he's, a, he's an infectious disease. You can't trust him for nothing. He's bloodthirsty. He wants to do these things. To, you see, this list that we have here about the, 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 the works of the flesh, these all affect other people. It affects the pleasure of the person, or rather the body of, of where it's coming from, but it still affects other people. Adultery, it affects other people. It's not just something that the person can do by themselves. You need somebody else to commit this sin with. Fornication, the same. Lasciviousness, witchcraft, hatred. Who are you hating? That's, that's, it's not something, you don't just sit around in the corner and just hate, just hate. That hate is directed towards something. So you can see how this sin is programmed to go against the brotherly covenant. It doesn't care about our neighbor. It doesn't care about God. This is what this thing is all about. I don't care about my neighbor. I've, he wants to commit adultery with his neighbor. He wants to commit fornication with his neighbor. He wants to be unclean around his neighbor. He wants to lust towards his neighbor. He wants to commit witchcraft. Why? So somebody can see it. So he can show himself powerful as if he's like a God, like Simon the sorcerer. That's what he wants. He's affecting the brotherly covenant. Sin is a, is, 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 is a cancer to the brotherly covenant. The Lord said, you will love the Lord thy Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what you better do. That's the first commandment, the greatest commandment. And the second, I put right up there with it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything that was said, everything that was written when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai, and he had those two stone tablets, praise the Lord. They represented the first and the second of the greatest commandments. This is it. I'm just spelling it out for you for your own purpose and reason so that you can see that you are a sinner and we got to do something about this thing. Because if we don't do something about this, this thing will encapsulate your entire person and you will be brought to a place where those during Noah's flood, praise the Lord, uh, found themselves in and died by the waters. I need for you to see what I see. He listed these commandments. But when you 
When you put it all up in a bowl and you mix it together, it says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it says. Even when you go before that, when God established this renovated earth and called what is nature good, it was all heavy laden in loving the Lord thy God first and loving your neighbor as yourself. That's what it was saying even from the beginning before he wrote it on tablets. They were supposed to understand that. God didn't make a, a world of hate. God didn't create this place a land of sin. Sin hates. God loves. And it, it, sin had nothing to do with this in the beginning when the Lord established Adam. But when he established Adam, he made sure he established him before Eve got there. So that he would understand first, the first and the greatest commandment, that you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I need for you to understand that, that I have the preeminence above all. Then once you understand that, now let's introduce somebody else into the picture so that you can understand the second of the greatest commandments, that you love your neighbor as yourself. This right here, I'm going to bring her into the picture this will be your Eve, this will be your wife. And you will love her as you love yourself. You can see the order of things. God first, then the neighbor came after that. And then he established, because he knew that even though they were good, and what he had done in renovating the world was good, there was still something in the cosmos. There was still that darkness, praise the Lord, that still existed. Because when we read past Genesis 1 and into 2, we see this darkness for the first time. Because before that, in Genesis 1-1, there was no darkness. Absolutely not. Not when you're dealing with a God of light. Why would there be darkness and light? There is none. Darkness came once those that he made fell into it and now created it. Enter Satan and a third of the angels that rebelled against God, created darkness into existence. So he knew that that was still there to the point that even when he had renovated the earth and made the firmament on the second day, that is the only day that is listed where he, at the end of the day, did not say it was good. Why? Because Satan is known as the prince of the power of the air, and he was in the first heavens. That's where he was. And he knew, the Lord knew that by having that demon around, praise the Lord, that there will be a second type of wisdom. There's God's wisdom, God's ways to establish what was good. This is good. But he knew what was over there, over yonder. Over there, separate from him, separate from the light, it was darkness. And it had its own wisdom. Its wisdom was full of the works of the flesh. Its wisdom was full of adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, all these things was in that wisdom. That's what it thinks. Sin. This is in the mind of sin. And when you become a sinner, he has engrafted himself within the matrix of your person. When the curse has come into the house, that role, that, that curse role has come into the house that Zechariah speaks about. It doesn't just come into the house. It, it blends in with the house. It's just like leprosy. When, le when a man is leprous, it gets into the entirety of his person. It, it even spreads into the house. It will just corrupt the entire place. And that's how sin behaves. That's what it will do. And so he understood there was another wisdom in existence. It was a wisdom of evil. And so by teaching Adam, he knew that at some point in time, this man had to understand how this thing works in here. 
that yes, you came into an existence where it is good, but then there's also evil. And you may say, my goodness, why would the Lord do that? Why did he just, just put him on, a, on, on Eden, uh, 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 this rock of Eden, in the best place of Eden, in the paradise of Eden, the garden of Eden? Why didn't he just leave him there and just eradicate sin altogether? Why? He could have done that. But the end game would not give him the end game that he will get at his second coming. And well, what is that? Well, I know that if a man is suffering, like Job. I know that if a man is being beat down by the, by the winds of life, I know when his family is coming against him and, and trying to convince him to curse God and die, and yet he holds on to the memory of me and the good that I have given him over the years. He refuses to let that go. He refuses to believe in a lie. He said, no, that's not my God. Yeah, I'm beat down, but you cannot convince me. You will not convince me that my God is evil. You will not convince me that this is his fault. I know that I'm a man that has a factory of sin working on the inside, trying to get me to do things I should not do. That's me. That's not him. I'm an honest man. I'm going to tell you this. I still have my mind about myself. I still have my wit about myself. I am convinced that neither death nor hell, nor things present, nor things to come, whatsoever it is, will not move me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what I discovered. I love him. And you will not convince me otherwise. He even said he even said said as much to his wife when his wife tried to get him to curse God and die. By choosing God, he stood on the side of Jesus. When Jesus asked Peter, "Praise the Lord, do you love me more than these?" Job loved God more than these. Oh yes, he did, because he wouldn't give in to his wife. So when God can see that, then he will say, like he said to Abraham, for now I know you believe in God. That's what he wants. He wants you to demonstrate that you believe in him. And the only way that you can do that is by going through supernatural situations. I say supernatural because these are situations that you can't get out of yourself. You can't do it by yourself. You have to be in a situation where the only one that can get you out of it is God. And so you wait patiently until he does that. That's why tribulation works patience. Because if it was something that you could do on your own, then there's no need to be patient. I'll just get up and do it myself, it's done. The patience defines the fact that you can't do it yourself. And the only way that you can get out of that is by waiting on the one who can get you out of that. That's why you are sent in to suffer. That's why you are allowed to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because God wants to see in the end that you believe him, you have faith in him, and you love in him more than these. But now I know you believe in God. And the person who can come out with that testimony from God in the end will receive the blessings that he ascribed unto Abraham. The righteous title, the righteous, the righteous uh, cloak that you can allow to wear, the linen garments that God gives you himself when you are a, when you're somebody who demonstrates, Lord, I know that you are my way and my truth and my life. Imagine how it was, saints, if Jesus never came and did what he did. Imagine how it was, would be. If he never came, then sin would continue to ravage our person like leprosy. It would. And you will find yourself with a resume 
a resume that will highlight everything you see in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, the works of the flesh. You would have done, if not all, a good portion of those things because sin works in you and it's working in you to bring you to wickedness. Paul said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, the body is death when, it's a, when it has sin on board. Death. It is a death sentence. Why? Because this body lives in an existence where God is holy, where there's a holy God who will not tolerate sin whatsoever. It is important for us to come up to him and not for him, him to lower his standards to come down to us. Absolutely not. That's not what's going to happen. He's the one that did not take the shoes off his feet because he stood on wicked ground. No, he tells Moses, take the shoes off your feet because you stand on holy ground. I am not lowering my standards for nobody, absolutely nobody. That's not how it works up in here. Only for now, because I established time, there is a beginning and an end to this entire thing up in here. And at the end, I want you to be able to stand with me high on the mountaintop with a song, the song of Moses on how you got over and how all your enemies were washed up in the Red Sea. I want to be over there. I want to be there to see the victory. I want to be there amongst the Israelites, amongst those who strive with God and man and prevails. I want to be there amongst the prince of God, amongst the sons of God, amongst the sons of men who are the repenters. Praise the Lord. I don't want to be on the other side where men are who are liars, according to numbers. I don't want to be there because a liar, praise the Lord, is somebody who's, a, who's allowing sin to manufacture the fruits, of, rather the works of the flesh in their person. I don't want that. If Christ didn't come, we would not have the means to mortify the body. We would not have the means. According to the scripture that we read, but if you, if ye, you, not just, no, this is not just anybody. This is a particular person we're talking about. Ye, he says, if ye through the spirit do mortify, praise the Lord, the, the deeds of the body, you shall live. Mortify, what does that mean? In the Greek, it is pronounced the not to old. It means to put to death, uh, cause to be put to death, kill, become dead, mortify, destroy, render, exist, uh, excuse me, render extinct uh, by death to be liberated from the bond of anything, literally to be made dead in relation to something. And this comes from the root word, the natos, uh, which is a Greek masculine noun. Uh, it's so it means death and deadly. So in other words, we do the works of the, through the spirit, we are able to put to death sin. You can't stop sinning by no other means except by the spirit of the living God. That's why Jesus said, it's important that I go to the Father. You need this Holy Ghost. You need the means to fight sin. This is the only way. This is the only way you could put sin to death. It doesn't go to sleep. And you can't lull it to sleep. You can't sing a lullaby to put it to sleep. You can't reason with it. Absolutely not. No, you cannot do that. You can't do any of those things. You got to kill it. And that's what the that's what Paul was Paul had mentioned when he had spoke about this. This is the not to all. This is to put it to death. I want sin to die. That's how the saints think. And so you got those who are probably have gone to Sunday school once or twice in their entire life and believe because they just went to Sunday school because their mother probably told them go to Sunday school is a good thing. And they went to one Sunday school class their entire life that they come out with a high degree higher than the highest of, of theologian degrees and question 
how could saints hate anything? Um, you better hate sin. Paul says that the Holy Spirit, that through the Spirit, you will mortify, you will put to death the deeds of the body. It is the Holy Spirit's objective to see sin die. Well, how can saints think like that? They're supposed to be so, you know, uh, you know, so good. They're all loving, loving. What are you talking about? Hate, hate, hate. No, you better hate this. You better hate this and you better hate anything that manufactures this. You better do it. And if you don't find yourself doing it, then you better check yourself because then you might find yourself walking in the same path as Lot's wife. Someone who has sympathy for sin, someone who is sympathetic uh, to the sodomites uh, as they were being destroyed uh, by the raining down of the fire, uh, hails of fire. Uh, you know, she was sympathetic to them. And God saw that heart. That, yeah, physically, I see you walking away with your husband, but God doesn't just look at the outside, He determines things from the inside. He looks at the source. He looks at the soul. The soul is not hanging out on the outside. The soul is on the inside. This is the body that houses the soul. This is a temple, a bodily temple. And yes, my character resides inside of this temple. My being, my entire uh, mindset, my beliefs, my, my, my heart is in here, not out there. So God is not looking at the outside. I want to see your soul. I want to look deep into your soul. Your soul won't lie to me. I can see it coming a mile away. I can smell it from here. If it's good or if it's bad. And he was able to determine that Lot's wife had the type of soul, the type of mindset that was no different than those people uh, in the city, beyond the city gates of Sodom that was being destroyed. There are two minds in existence, That's what I was mentioning earlier. And he was trying to get Adam to see this. So he established these illustrations. He's got this two trees, two distinct trees that he puts in the garden. The tree of life on one side and then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he sits back after Adam has gotten to a point where God even knew that he knew enough that he had enough within him to be able to turn down anything that came from the other mind. Um, he wouldn't just allow that, that, that exchange to happen, that conversation to happen before uh, he came to a knowledge of the truth. He had it first by establishing himself to be just with him shows that Adam was learning that you must love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength first. Then by bringing Eve along secondly, now he was learning how I need to love my neighbor as myself. So you know he was being educated in that garden. He was not allowed to eat from the tree of life, not yet. That tree was, was forbidden to be touched. Why? Because it goes to show that the Lord is looking to see if this man loves me more than these. Once that is determined, like when you look in the Revelation of the account, he speaks to a particular church and he says that, look, if you overcome, I'll allow you to eat from the tree of life. I'll allow you to drink from the living waters. I'll allow these things to happen. This is what's going to happen in the, the new heaven and the new earth. These things will be accessible unto all of the citizens who make it over. Praise the Lord. Pray we all do. So, these were given to those who overcame. So Adam could not touch that tree yet until he showed God that he overcame. Overcame what? What? What is it? What's going on? What? Once he had, once he was equipped with loving the, uh, the knowledge of loving God first and loving your neighbor as yourself, then the serpent was allowed to come. He saw there was another tree there. It was commanded, don't touch that tree. Don't, don't, don't eat from that tree. Don't you do it. And so that tree represented a different mindset, a different, um, you know, type of worldview. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, but then when you look at the namesake, 
it kind of tells you that it's 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 like an anti God type tree, antichrist type tree, because God is wisdom. And Jesus himself has already identified himself as the vine. He's the true vine. He's the true tree, you know, and he's the omniscient one. God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. God is all wisdom. How is this tree going to sit up here and tell you that it's wisdom? I'm wisdom. So it was a type of antichrist type of tree. And so it shows that the tree has, uh, it, it pretty much invites spirits to it. The wrong type of spirit. Uh, it brought the subtlety of the serpent around who was influenced by Satan. Satan was there. And we know he was there because he was judged with the rest of them after God, uh, you know, uh, revealed how wrong it was for Adam and Eve to do it. Satan was there and he was judged along with the rest of them. You don't see him in the exchange between uh, Adam, excuse me, Eve and the serpent. Um, but he was there and the Lord revealed him. And spoke about it, how the seed of the woman is going to bruise your head. He's going to give you a death blow and you won't exist no more. You're going to you're going to slowly bleed out. That's what's going to happen. You're going to die. And so that tree, once they ate from that tree, when God put a command on it, don't do it. You do it and you will die. That was sin. That invited sin within the person. Because once they did it, now they were sinners. And then God said, now the man has become like us to know the difference between good and evil. It's not that the tree gave him the knowledge of good and evil. The tree brought evil is what it brought. Look what the outcome was. They, they were dying. They were considered dead, spiritually speaking. The knowledge of good and evil came because God judged the evil. The Lord stood like the Holy Ghost who comes to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he determined that that was evil. Now they know the difference between good and evil because they see me over here and they recognize that I got the power and I'm good. And then they see that thing over there and they recognize that it brought them into a folly. It brought them into a place of, of dismay. It brought them into a place of confusion it messed with their mind. It made them feel, uh, you know, uh, as if they were alone and ostracized. So what sin did, even Jesus, when he took on the sins of the, of, of the world upon himself, said, my father, why is thou forsaken me? You feel alone. You feel naked because you are. Because the covering that was once on top of you, the Lord as like Boaz has covered Ruth's feet is now being pulled away the protection of God is off of you. Now you are out in the cold. You see, that's what sin will do. It will put you out in the cold. It is so against God that it will take you from the protection of God and all of the blessings that are ascribed unto being under his protection away. And you are left to fend for yourself. You are now a slave to sin. And we already discussed what sin is, is, is started doing. Once Adam and Eve sinned, the factory in the body of death started, started to chime up and work. All of a sudden, the, 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 the furnace started to go. And they started to produce the evil works of fornication, adultery, uncleanness, lasciviousness, all these lusts. They just worked on to produce a lust for these things, a taste for these things an appetite for these things and it wasn't just isolated in the in the in the in the torso or in the leg it was everywhere the entire being was becoming corrupt by this thing like leprosy just spreading all over it my goodness who shall deliver me from the body of this death that's what paul said i feel something and it's fighting against the law of my mind it just wants to take over he doesn't sleep he goes into my dreams, my goodness. Even when I'm asleep, I'm not even conscious. He's still working on me, trying to bring me down. He doesn't stop. He wants to see us totally consumed. Adam and Eve, once they ate that fruit, they ate sin. And now it just, it was disgusting, the feeling, it was, it was, it was such a, dis, a regret that came upon them right after that, a regret. Oh my gosh, they were so remorseful. Lord, 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the Lord saw how repentant they were. That's why he slayed the animal, which represented the slaying of Christ. Praise the Lord. So you saw Jesus in the picture going all the way back to Genesis chapter one. Covered him up, gave him some comfort, it did. Yes, it did, it gave him some comfort because it was a representation of Christ, the comforter. Felt a little better. But that night when they went to sleep for the first time outside that garden, still didn't feel like it did when I was in the garden, Adam said. It's things a little different now that I'm, I'm on this side of the fence. See them animals looking at me a little different than they were because I was giving them a name. I see them snarling at me. I got to defend myself. I got to do something. I didn't have the power that I once had because I had the, I had the cloak of God over me, covering me. Now I'm naked. I don't have that. I got this animal skin. I'm going to hold on to that until it begins to rot. My goodness, now I got to sacrifice something else because I got to have that covering on me. I got to feel that protection on me. And then he began to teach his children that. Abel learned that. You better slay the animal, praise the Lord, if you want to feel some comfort. That comfort is the comforter, the representation of the comforter, which is Christ. But I feel still, my head is going crazy. I feel death in me. Do you understand what death is? Death is the separation of life. That's all it is in its basic form. It is the, it is the anti-life. It's not just that you see your loved one or your friends, whoever it is, a person passes and that's it, that's death. No, let's look deeper. They had life. Who is life? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth. I'm the life. What we have here, as I'm talking to you, as you're listening, as you're sitting with your family in your home, you have a type and shadow of Jesus all over you because you have life. But then when that's taken away, when that's not there no more, that's death. It separates your being from life. Now we know that all live unto God. That's why there are souls in hell still alive, but separate from life. They're dead because they're separate from life. And the Lord is illustrating unto us all how important to be with life is. You need me, is what he is saying. He's trying to convince, he's trying to shake it, this knowledge in us. You need me. Can't you see? You can't do this thing on your own. That's John chapter 15. You can't do this on your own. Without me, you can do nothing. Do you under, You think I'm just saying that because I'm God? You think I'm, I'm, I, I have this pride about me, huh? This God thing about me that I just need people to worship? No, I'm telling you the truth. I counsel wisdom is what Proverbs speaks about. I speak with wisdom. I am wisdom. I counsel it and I'm giving you wisdom. Just receive it. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying unto the churches. I am beckoning unto you. I'm crying from every rooftop to try to convince you that you need me, that without me, you cannot do the things that you would like to do. The things that your feet are taking you to are the things that the body of sin wants. And you don't, you shouldn't do that. Why? Because it will bring you to death. We read that in Romans 8, 13. If you live after the flesh, you will die. Come unto me. All ye that are, that are burdened, that are heavy laden, come unto me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You're not the one that mortifies sin. You can't do it. You got those folks every New Year's talking about, a, you know, um, I want to, I wanna, you know, come up with a new way of doing things. I want to live right. I want to change my life. Oh, so I'll stop doing this. So that means I'm good now. No, it don't. You're still in the body of death. Yes, you are. Yeah, you're capable of doing anything. Oh, yes, you are. No, I'm not. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, you let temptation come to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You allowed sin to, to manufacture itself throughout your entire person. All this time, just manufacturing lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life. It's in your matrix. It's a part of your entire being. It's within the fiber of your person. Your entire being is in, being, coming encapsulated by this, this 
this demonic law and it is now infused itself on you and it moves about you like like leprosy moves it will start in one place and then it will begin to spread and it not only spreads but it will take away your limbs is what it will do this is the character and the attributes of what happens when somebody is becoming completely leprous it starts off like a spot at first and you may think that it's just going to stay there oh well i'll just treat it like a birthmark it will not stay there it will grow it will spread it will move about from one portion of your body onto the other portion of your body so even though this this horn might be healthy today it may not look the same next year it may not and then what it does, it eats up the limbs to the point where now you don't even have extremities anymore. Your fingers become nubs. You don't have that no more. It takes your feet away from you is what it will do. It even takes your nasal cavity away from you. So now you look like one of those, you see your skeleton just about exposed. You have no nose anymore. And then it gets into your back is what it does. It gets all up in there, intertwines with your spine and severs the nerves to the point where you don't feel pain or anything anymore. Oh, that's a good thing. I don't like pain anyway. You need pain. You need to know if something is right and you need to know if something is wrong. That's why suffering is there. I don't like suffering. I'm gonna try to do what I can to get out of it. Lord, help me. And then you cry out to God and he comes to bless you. So you need to have a sense of what suffering is. But if you don't feel it, then you're no different than somebody who's reprobate. You're out there just doing stuff, don't even know that you're doing wrong. There are ways that seem right into a man, but the end thereof are the ways which lead up unto death. That's the Bible. And this is what leprosy does. It just takes over like that. And you may say, my goodness, well, okay, I got no hands no more. I got no feet no more. I got no more nose. I can't even feel anything. No more nerves. Okay, all right. I just, I have to somehow live like this. You're not reading between the lines. The letter killeth, but it's the spirit that giveth life. You need to put on your glasses, your, your spiritual godly glasses, and look deeper and understand what this represents. Theology is the study of God, understanding the intent of God and why he said things and why he does things. It behooves every last Christian, every last person for that matter, to understand what God is saying. So that way we would know to choose God and not choose man. Need to know. I need my theology. I need to know God. So in this situation, what are you telling me? Because if you go into the Leviticus, you see there's like chapters dedicated to leprosy. What are you telling me? There were other sicknesses in the land. But why are you focused here? It's because of what it represents. It represents what sin is going to do to you if you just let it run amok. You won't have your hands, no feet. You won't have your nose. You won't have your back. Okay, I get that. Well, what does it represent? My goodness, can you not see that it represents? First of all, if you don't got your nerves, you can't feel pain. You can't know to cry out to God. You don't know you're in trouble. You, The devil can run you down the street and you think he's the best. He's your best buddy. That's your homeboy. Hey, who are you hanging out with tonight? I'm hanging out with Satan. Satan. Yeah, he's my homeboy. Running around it, don't even know he's evil. Don't even know he's calculating your demise. Don't even know he wants to bring you to destruction. That's what it represents when you don't have your nerves. And then you may say, okay, well, what is the nose not being there? My goodness, did not God breathe through Adam the breath of life through his nose and he became a living soul? It represents my goodness, uh, my receptive of, rather my receiving of, of God coming into the sanctuary. Even in Ezekiel, it speaks about how you go into the sanctuary by the two leave gates. And you can only get in there by the two leave gates. Well, my nose has cilia inside of it, hairs. It can be likened unto the two leave gates, two nostrils, and God breathed through to get into the sanctuary of Adam. Now that's not there. So if it's not there, how's he getting into Adam? Not to say he can't, he, get it any other way but i'm trying to illustrate to you what it represents that he can no longer he sin has encapsulated him and has enveloped him uh, uh, and corrupted him to the point where he can't receive god he can't receive the breath of god that's what sin is going to do it's going to corrupt it's going to sever your ability to receive god that's what happened to the children of men uh, during the flood, they got to the point where God did not 
uh, rescue them. That's it. They were irre they were they couldn't be redeemed. That was it. They were destroyed, and only eight souls made it out. There was only Lot and his two daughters that made it out of Sodom. Made a deal with uh, Abraham. If I find ten in the city, yes, I will not destroy the city for ten's sake. Could not find ten amongst not just the seniors of the city, because the Bible says that it was the whole city that came before Adam. These men, and they were old and young. Kids got corrupt. That's why you got to really pay attention to what the world is doing with this LGBT plus Q community trying to go into our schools, our kids' schools, and reading, uh, you know, these 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 liberal books unto them, uh, being read by transvestites in their costumes, looking like demons. They're indoctrinating the kids. Those kids in Sodom became indoctrinated. And they believed it and, it and it corrupted them. The blind lead the blind, they all fall into the ditch. So then if you don't have your nose, okay, now you're saying that a person has gotten to a point in sin that they can no longer receive the breath of God. They can no longer receive these things and they can't even feel themselves in evil. Why? Because they don't have any nerves anymore. They don't know they're in, they have a reprobate mind. And so, okay, well, what about my hands? I don't got my hands anymore because the leprosy just corrupted that and took that away. You're right, you don't and you don't have your feet anymore. The hands have my 10 fingers in it, right? And the feet have my 10 toes about it. The body is a temple, for goodness sakes, is what Jesus said. You destroy this body, and in three days' time, I'll make it rise again. It's a representation of a temple. In the temple, there were two main furniture pieces uh, outside of the altar of incense, which sat right at the uh, at the base of the holies of holies. If you stand this, the, the temple upright, which as we see in Ezekiel has steps going upward. So that altar of incense is found somewhere in the body and like the neck. It's where the voice is. It's where the praise is. It's where the, it's where the prayers come from. It's, it's what it represents going into the sanctuary. And then it had the other two pieces of furniture in the holy place, which on one side, like the arm, is the altar of in, as a, is the uh, table of showbread. And on the other side, you had the candlesticks, uh, you know, that lit it, that lit the, the, the interior, uh, the seven golden candles, the, the seven candelabra of the, of the holy place, you know, which can be likened unto the arms of the place, for goodness sake. So if you sever that, now sin has corrupted that. The table of showbread represented God's providing his, 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 uh, your, for your natural needs. The, the candlestick represents God providing for your spiritual needs. Well, that's gone. He's not going to provide for you naturally. He's not going to provide for you spiritually. You're being completely iniquitous. And then the legs outside of the temple, you had what? Those two pieces of furniture. You had the bronze laver and you had the burnt, the, um, the bronze altar, which, which is where the sacrifices took place. Okay, so now that's gone. So now you don't have a means to be water baptized. And you don't have a means to be fire baptized. You are a sinner completely. Now you are iniquitous. And that's what leprosy represents and what it's going to do. So my goodness, how do we get out of this? You got folks out there, and I've, I've debated with some folks. I've reasoned with some folks, and you'll be surprised within Christendom. You got a lot of folks who are hanging their hat on just believing Jesus, and that's it. They don't want to go out any further than, than that. They don't go out into the deep. They don't go out and try to uh, understand what that means. They, they just It's almost as if they, they're okay and content with, with, with Sunday School 101 information. No. If you believe, you shall be saved, is what the Bible, you shall be saved. Not that you are saved, but you will be saved as long as you believe. In other words, the good shepherd, as long as you believe, as long as you come to him with a broken spirit and a contrite heart of which he will no wise despise, he will take you by the hand as the good shepherd. He will then bring you to the place where the still waters are to provide for your, for your natural needs and your spiritual needs. And he will bring you to the green pastures, again, to do the same. And he will bring you within his sheepfold to protect you away from the wolves of society, of the demons of society, those satanically influenced things of society. That's what being in Jesus is. 
So you shall be saved as he's nurturing you, praise the Lord, like a baby that's born into existence. We don't know what that child is going to be at the start and day one when you're holding your baby in your hand and you're looking down and you're wondering, who are you going to be? We don't know. So what do we do? We nurture that child. We, 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 we care for that child. We give that child everything he possibly could have so that he has and she has, praise the Lord, a means to be a good person, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're older, they will not depart from it. Praise the Lord. So after we've done all of that, they stand up to become godly people. The, the, the godly seed is which the Lord is looking for, according to Ma, uh, Malachi. Praise the Lord is what he speaks about. He's looking for the godly seed, not the corrupt seed. He's looking for the godly seed. And so this is what happens when a person turns to God. Yes, if you believe in Jesus, you shall be saved. Why? Because he's going to nurture you like we nurture, praise the Lord, uh, the, the, our children to become godly seeds in the sight of the Lord. It's not that they automatically are born in this world as godly seeds, because that's how they think these folks out there who just hang their hat on that scripture and say, well, Jesus did it all. I got nothing else to do. No. You still have things to do. We read Romans 8. Romans 8 said, but if you, if you, through the spirit, so this is not just anybody. This is somebody who has a spirit. If you, Romans 8, 13, through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Okay, so that flies in the face of everybody who says, Oh, Jesus did it all. I don't have to do nothing. Just sit back. Where's the rapture? Come on, let's get it going. Can't wait to go upstairs and party all the time. No, that's not how it works. You got to mortify the deeds of the body. You got saved. Yes, but the deeds of the body is still functional. Paul said that. He says, I feel something warring against the law of my mind, trying to bring me in subjection unto itself. My goodness, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So the body of death was trying to take over his body. That's what's happening. So you can't just sit around thinking I'm saved. I ain't got nothing to do. Jesus did it all, you know, so I can just sit back and do absolutely nothing. No, you can't. You are supposed to mortify the deeds of the body through the spirit. That's what you're supposed to do. And if you don't, then the deeds of the body will, will, will mortify you. And we already defined what that meant. It meant kill you. This thing is an internal enemy. Everybody has it. I don't care who you are. I don't care what title you got. I don't care how long you've been in the church. It means nothing. Let a man take heed unto these things, lest he fall. The apostles understood that and taught that. And even they were infected by this. Are, they, are we greater than they? I don't know who we... One of us is. Who knows? I have no idea. God knoweth who belongs in what seat or another, but let him determine that. In the meantime, we got to occupy ourselves till he comes. We got to adorn ourselves as a bride properly. That means you better mortify the deeds of the body. He's not looking for somebody who, whose garment has spots on it. We are the bride of Christ. We have been betrothed unto him. He has given us the means to be able to meet the bridegroom when he comes. We don't know when that day is. Only the father, whom we will tell his son, go get your bride. Then that will happen. But we got to do our part to that, that day comes. He's looking for somebody whose garments are not spotted or blemished. That means you're looking for somebody who has mortified the deeds of the body. Because if you allow the deeds of the body to take root inside of us, then it will bring spots and blemishes. It will. Why? Because God made man upright. But we have sought out many inventions. They got themselves dirty. The dirt demonstrates the God that you are, you have been, you have been frolicking with the, the deeds of the body. Look at what happened to Joshua, the high priest, in Zechariah chapter three. He stood there before God, like we all should. Satan was on his right hand. The right arm represents the power. So whatever Joshua was trying to do, Satan was there to hinder him. And he, but, but Joshua, the way he's, he's illustrated, he just keeps looking at, at the Lord. He doesn't turn his head. He still looks at him. Even though Satan is trying to hinder him on his right side, he's trying everything he possibly can do to keep him from doing the good that God wants him to do. 
I got to get to this man. I got to get to him and I got to stop him. I got to stop him because he's destroying the deeds of his own body. The factory cannot produce. It cannot be productive. It cannot produce adultery, the lust of adultery and fornication and uncleanness and lascivious. It can't do these things if, if he doesn't think about these things. And, and I've got to take over his mind. You beat on that door. Beat on Joshua's mind until you get through. Paul said, I feel something warring against the law of my mind is what he said. That's what he said. But Joshua said, no, that door is going to stay closed like a faithful priest in the bodily temple that the Lord has assigned them to. Like a faithful priest. I'm not opening up that door. Yeah, I know they sound scary on the outside, on the other side. They're threatening me. They're threatening me. I feel like I'm alone up in here. But no, I'm going to be patient because I know that one time or another, at some time, there's going to be another door that's going to open and I will be able to escape through it. I can't see it now, but I know it's there. I'm going to keep my eyes on the one who has given me the capacity to make it through. And when he decides to let me through, I will have the victory. Because tribulation works patience. And patience works an experience. Now you know God. And experience works hope. Hope that you and God are going to be right on each other's side. And you're going to sing that song of Moses about how you got over. About how the spiritual Pharaoh and his army was drowned in the Red Sea. And you walked on dry ground by a miracle. That was a supernatural situation. I don't see a door is what Moses, I don't see a door, Moses said. But I'm going to wait. I can hear the Egyptians coming. I can hear the hooves of the horses. They're coming my way. And all of a sudden, the Lord opened up a door in a place you would never expect it. My goodness, he's parted the Red Sea. Made it to the other side on dry ground. Suck up all. The, the, the Red Sea had to obey everything that God said. I want you to stand up and salute your brethren. I want you to stand up and, 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 and show respect unto your brethren. As if they're walking up Jacob's ladder and on each side you had the angels. As they made their way up to where God was in the mount. In the Mount Sinai. Zion. Singing a song. So we cannot be high-minded saints. Uh-uh. Not when we have this, this death trap inside of us. Trying to trap us. Inside of us. Building up trying to generate lust for these things that you read in Galatians 5, 19. These things, these lusts of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of, these things, these lust, trying to get you full of it so that when temptation comes, now that's separate. And that's what we're gonna talk about next week. When temptation comes, my goodness, because you have been doing everything you could to allow lust to just, just build up inside of you. Now here comes temptation. Temptation doesn't just come to see, he's not coming to see just anybody. He's coming to see your lust. He's knocking on the door. Can your lust come out and play? And can you come out and play? It speaks very nicely, very sweet is the way he talks. She talks, whoever it is that temptation, just trying to convince you to come on outside. That's what it's trying to do. But that's why you have to have the mind of Christ. Because when he tried it, when Satan tried it to Jesus, it is written. It is written. He had no lust inside of him. It is written. And that demon had to flee. You don't mortify the deeds of the body by you waking up one day and say, I'm going to be, a, I'm a Christian. Some people think that. No, oh, I'm saved. I'm holy. I'm, you know, and then they cursing up a storm five more minutes later. Or they going in the back alley smoking, you know, doing all of these things that the world does, looking no different just by, it's like a building with a cross on it. But on the inside, there's a, there's a den of thieves. The temple looked like the temple on the outside. But when Jesus went in to look at his soul, he saw that it was a den of thieves. 
that's how it is when folks are just waking up one day talking about I'm a Christian and they don't they don't do what he says. How is it that you're going to call me Lord and you don't do the things that I'm saying? How is it? It's impossible. I'm not your Lord. Don't play with me. You know, Jesus spoke about the spoke about this to the Pharisees, those that spoke against them. Oh, you think you're Abraham's seed. Oh, yes, you do. That's what you think. Abraham didn't speak to me the way you speaking to me. You're not children of Abraham. You're not children of God. What are you talking about? We're Israel. God can take any one of these stones and make an Israelite if he wants. That's not what makes Israel Israel. Look at the definition of the word. It's a prince who strives with God through everything that God will have him to do, and he will do it. And he strives with man. He's patient with humanity. Why? Because that's a sign that he's fulfilling the Great Commission. He's laboring. And the woman shall be saved through childbearing. In other words, the church shall be saved through the Great Commission because she went out and did what God told her to do. She received the Holy Ghost, didn't just sit around in Jerusalem, went out into the uttermost part of the world to do what doth say of the Lord. That's what she did. The Lord said, do it. She went and did it. She's the Proverb 31 wife. She wasn't just sitting at home, just doing any, you know, doing what she wants to do. No, she was about her husband's business while he was at the gate with the elders. And so when he came home, he saw that there was productivity, that even while he was away, productivity is still going on. She demonstrated that she was given five seeds, right? The five talents. When he comes home, he sees it double. That's what he saw. The woman who doesn't uh, do these things uh, sits around, and that's no different than one of the five foolish versions who had the capacity to do these things that the five wise did, but didn't. And the Lord said of them, I don't know you. So we'll be saved. Why? Because we obey God. That's what it comes down to. So saints, uh, we're going to stop there. We do thank the Lord for the opportunity to have this discussion. Next week, this is, this is a part one. So part two will be about more about uh, uh, discussions on temptation and the effects and what it's, what it's trying to do in all of this. So it's gonna build upon the conversation that we're having now. And also uh, the fruits of the spirit and what would happen if we uh, allow ourselves um, to allow the Holy Ghost to mortify the deeds of the flesh, what, what, what our end game is going to be and how we're supposed to generate love. So again, we do thank the Lord for the opportunity, amen. And um, before I turn the uh, service over to the hands of uh, Elder Betts for closing remarks, I'd like to invite anybody who has a question or a comment, uh, praise the Lord, please feel free uh, to bring it to the table in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This was, um, I'm going to say eye-opening and all of that, because it makes you check yourself. If you don't check yourself, <laughs> I, I don't know what to say about you, but I have to check Nancy every now and then. I have to check her sometimes all day, because sometimes we do stuff. And we don't realize we said or done a thought and we're out of order and don't realize it. And I praise God for this. I really do. Um, I just want to be right with God and I want him to look at me and see his self. I want to be his mirror. And I praise the Lord for all of this. I really do. And I, I'm not going to tie up the line, but I just thank you, Elder Bonet. And I praise God for you, son. I, I really you. do. And I thank you for telling it like it is in Jesus' name. You somebody's preacher. I'm going there. Praise yes, you are. You are a preacher in your own right. And you preach the truth in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, is there anyone else who has a, a 
comment or question, uh, praise the Lord. Um, before oh, we... the bonnet. Praise the Lord. It was a very powerful lesson and thought provoking, which says that when things happen because of this lesson, it, your memory will absorb what's happening. And then the teaching will take action with what is happening at that time. So the lesson, powerful. God bless you. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise Thought the Lord. provoking, yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 We do thank the Lord. Amen. Um, again, for the opportunity to have a discussion um, like this. Yeah, it's not popular in a lot of places, but nevertheless, cry aloud and spare not. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, and um, I'd like to now invite uh, Elder Betts, praise the Lord, amen, for closing remarks in Jesus' name. We say praise the Lord and good evening to all, amen. Protocol has been established and we do thank God for the Dean of the Central Jersey Bible Institute and instructor this evening, Elder Thomas Bonet. Amen. Faithful. Amen. Consistent, devoted, anointed man of God. And we thank you for blessing us this evening. Amen. I agree. Amen. With what has been said from Mother Rowe. Amen. And Sister Miranda Qualls. I agree. When we look at the topic, the increase of love and the mortification of sin. I remember telling someone one time that fear brought me to Christ. When Bishop Michael Greer preached that message that if you didn't receive the Holy Ghost, you were going to go to hell. And when I went home that Sunday morning and asked Mother Betts, I said, Mom, is hell a real place? Well, rather than her trying to sugarcoat it and say, well, son, you know, people talk. No, she said, yeah, it's real. And if you don't get the Holy Ghost, that's where you're going. <laughs> that, hit, that hit home. <laughs> like you said, you have to tell it like it is. She told it like it is. That hit home. And next thing you know, I was on the altar tearing for the Holy Ghost because I was afraid of going to hell. But as the lesson states tonight, amen, the increase of love. That fear turned to love. I mean, I was afraid and that drove me to him. But once I came to Christ, that fear was gone. And now there's a love there. Uh, like you were saying, Elder Bonet, we don't, you know, jump up and down in church and then, you know, leave the church and go to the club, you know, you know, and, and say, well, ain't nobody that knows me in church is going to see me here. Uh, we don't do those things because of our love. We don't want to mess up our relationship that we have with the Lord. No one has to follow us and watch us and see if we're living right. When you love the Lord, the increase of love, it brings about the mortification. It, I mean, there's something about being in love. No wonder that songwriter wrote that song, Falling in Love with Jesus. <laughs> no wonder he wrote that song. It's the, it's the greatest thing I've ever done. Amen. So I guess you could tell by how much I'm talking. I, I feel the word tonight and I thank God for what you've given us, Sarah. And thank you for this opportunity and this space. I'm looking forward to part two. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you all the best. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Amen. Join us again next week. Um, next week, Thursday, we'll, we'll have part two and um, uh, we hope to see you there in Jesus name and uh, join us again. Also tomorrow evening, uh, praise the Lord, amen. Thank you, Sister Miranda, amen. Join us tomorrow evening, uh, Pastor Betts, amen, is having a Bible teaching night, amen, on the topic of what time is it? This is part two to that discussion. So same Zoom information, this will be Friday night, tomorrow night at uh, seven o'clock is the login time and 7.15 is the start of the, uh, the lesson. So. So join us again tomorrow evening, amen. This is a special Bible teaching night that will be uh, led by uh, Pastor Betts, amen, in Jesus' name. Um, also, uh, praise the Lord, uh, look for the Central Jersey Bible Institute on, um, on YouTube. Uh, we have uh, a YouTube page uh, where we're trying to be consistent about uploading uh, these encouragement series um, recordings. These are recorded 
lessons. Um, and so we try to upload them so that, you know, they're accessible uh, for anybody who wants to, you know, revisit it. Um, so, uh, you know, we be patient with us as we gather the recordings and try to upload them. Um, but if you subscribe to our page, you will get an alert when they are uploaded. So we have a bunch that we need to upload and that we will be uploading soon. So um, get ready for the uh, uh, the deluge <laughs> of encouragement series that's about to come up there. Um, all right. And Praise so- Praise the Lord. I, I just want uh, uh, Missionary Miranda to please, please send that to me so I can um, send it out. Cause I, I got um, some people they want me to tarry with in Florida and I try to invite those that aren't saved to these, um, you know, to these segments. And if she could please get that to me, I really, really appreciate it. Cause a lot of them that I send out, they're not church of our Lord. And that's not to say, you know, but they're not. And, um, you know, to give them something that's, you know that's edifying and that's the truth is it helps a lot. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. 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 We'll definitely try to make this accessible, like with, with all of the encouragement series accessible um, online as well. So uh, amen. Amen. We'll definitely try to make it happen in Jesus name. And, um, and now without further ado, let us close out. Uh, I invite everybody to pray with me. Uh, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we love and thank you. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to bless us and that you will continue to bring us into the knowledge of the truth. You, Lord, will continue, Lord, to do your work upon us that we may mortify the deeds of the body. Uh, show yourself strong through every last one of us, Lord God, as we see, Lord God, that which uh, has once taken over our person uh, is running in retreat and uh, will no longer be a problem for us. Um, we know that you're able, Lord God, for you have already uh, proclaimed that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So, Lord God, uh, we're becoming witnesses to that. And so you begin to do even that within our own bodily temple as you remove those things that do offend and cast out the, the spiritual money changers so that our house will be known as a house of prayer and not a den of thieves. Again, bless us all that are here and those that were here, those that wanted to be here, couldn't be here. Bless the church. Keep us all rapture ready. Keep us from the enemy, Lord God. And again, lead us to and fro into the, the place where you are. We love and thank you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen and amen. Amen, everybody. Amen. amen. Love you all. Love you. God and bless. And I praise God for this. Have a blessed and wonderful night, everybody. Amen. Love you. And, and, and Elder Bonet, keep on keeping on. Keep oh, on. Because you got some pretty feet, okay? Beautiful Good out of feet of those that carry the gospel. So you got some pretty feet. I ain't never seen them, but Praise I'm them. claiming them to be that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love y'all. I love you. Y'all pray for me. God bless. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Sister Miranda. Yep, yep.